from Leeway. Um, uh, we have uh, now Jonathan who will be giving our talk, uh, the talk which was entitled The Arab of the Future or the Future of Arab Economics. Well, first I want to thank uh, AUB, I want to thank Lena for hosting this cutting edge initiative here in this extraordinary group of presenters today. It's, it's an honor to be a part of the, the first year of, of the Mutazin Rada al Sawaf Comic Initiatives uh, Symposium. And uh, it, it's just really exciting what's going on here. I was just thinking, arriving, that this is really a, a marriage of area studies and aesthetics and, and all these other fields of study that are really part of a new cutting edge way to look at comics. So, when Lena first told me that today would be themed around memoirs and personal narratives, I began to thumb through stacks of comics. And although all comics have a personal bent, I wondered what it meant when an artist draws a personal narrative. Comics are a medium uniquely suited for conveying personal tales, as we've been talking about all morning. Uh, whether science fiction or fantasy, crime noirs like Magdi al Shafai's Metro, or Zaglul Effendi, the artist's voice always comes through. The author plays with time, moving back and forth, inserting dreams and misremembered moments, rather than asserting a rigid chronology. Comic artists portray stories in a nonlinear fashion, which provides the opportunity to piece together personal vignettes that don't necessarily fit neatly together. It's not just in terms of narratology, but also in terms of the art and aesthetics. Even when drawing a futuristic serial or a historical comic, the characters that artists draw tend to look like themselves. If you look at Magdi's Metro or Shinawi's art or Lina's art, there's always this kind of personal touch that all comics have. Uh, so if in this way comics always contain personal elements, then what does it mean when an artist choo chooses to draw a specifically autobiographical tale, an illustrated memoir? Uh, so this, this led me to to notice another trend in comic publishing, which is that there's a preponderance of comic memoirs written for adults about childhood. From Persepolis to Fun Home and dozens in between, why are so many comics for adults about childhood? Um, now, my background is really studying political cartoons, so this is where I brought in something a little different here. In, um, in comics, what I've discovered is that the child is not an innocuous force or a simple narrative technique. The child represents an important figure for her capacity to tell truth, especially in political cartoons or caricature. I noticed that uh, this wave of childhood memoirs could really, um, wh what I mean to say is when children appear in political cartoons, they always offer this biting bit of analysis, unfettered by taboos, uninhibited by societal rules. When little rascals get into trouble, they articulate the ridiculousness of social customs or the emptiness of political speech. In the imaginary world of caricature, the child is often the voice of truth or reason, representing the, a powerful lens of naivete, depicting obvious realities that can be only conveyed through the voice of innocence. Here I'm speaking particularly of Georges Barouri's uh, young boy saying to his father, Papa, does January 25th come every year? Uh, or the quiet gaze of Naji El Ali's Handala, or in some of Andil's cartoons uh, for the Egyptian outlet Mata Masr. Uh, in this July cartoon, uh, we, have a, we have a child asking, so daddy, I heard that gay people are now allowed to get married in the US. What does gay mean though? And then in the next frame, the father has cut off uh, the son's ears. In, in late 2013, uh, the cartoon, in, Cartoonist, comic artist Andil told me, politicians are treating Egyptians as children. This points to something contradictory. Politicians treat citizens as children, but children are often the most perceptive and rebellious in their thinking and their actions. But Andil's quip about the patriarchal state only explains one aspect of why cartoonists use children to convey punchlines. The fact is that children understand a lot more than adults give them credit for. Uh, here, the American political scientist and the father, Joshua Stacker, makes this point in an essay in 2013 for the Middle East Report about his eight-year-old daughter and her friends growing up in Egypt during Morsi's year in power. 
Stacker took his daughter to Tahrir Square for the first time, and he relayed this scene, and I quote, when I asked her if she knew what had happened here, she looked, at, she looked at me as if I were a moron. Dad, she said, everyone knows, the people want the downfall of the regime. So to consider why adults are so fascinated with childhood narratives, I'm going to focus my talk today on Riyad Satouf's new graphic novel, The Arab of the Future. It's a morose treatment of a multicultural childhood. Satouf, a Franco-Syrian comic artist who has drawn for Charlie Hebdo, was raised in France, Libya, and Syria. The first of his four-volume series has just been translated to English, as well as 14 other languages. The book has sold 200,000 copies in France, won the award for the best album at Angoulême, and is starting new conversations about identity in Paris and beyond. In the Arab of the future, the reader glimpses into Satouf's turbulent childhood through vignettes and memories, Qaddafi on TV, Hafez, Hafez al-Assad on billboards, and other moments when high politics enter daily life. Most interesting is the tension between his Arab identity and French identity, his Syrian father's pan-Arabism and his French mother's cosmopolitanism. Again, the figure of the child offers a matter-of-fact critique of these politics, however unwittingly. When Syrian cousins deride the young Satouf as a Jew, though none of them have ever met a Jew, the reader gets a view of anti-Semitism told in a child's voice without any judgment or commentary. It's an unfettered view of a troubled scene. I want to briefly note here that throughout this talk, I'm going to talk about a very broad definition of Arab comics so that we can include someone like Satouf who writes in French and again challenging these questions of identity that are no doubt part of the Arab comics tradition. So when, when Satouf was interviewed, He's been incredibly vague about his choices, whether narrative, aesthetic, or otherwise. He is ambiguous about the boundaries of the truth in this story and flippant about the book's political message. Importantly, Satouf told the journalist Adam Schatz that he wanted to convey, quote, the ignorance of childhood. So when Hafez al-Assad is discussed, there's no footnote about his son Bashar or the ongoing civil war. When the Satouf family visits the ancient city of Palmyra, the author does not hit, hint at its future wreckage at the hands of the Islamic State. The book is strictly written from memory, not through reference books. So what can we make of the narrative tool that comprises of this innocence of childhood? And what makes this lens so compelling to readers? Here I want to bring in the theorist and writer Walter Benjamin, who similarly invoked tales of his upbringing through a voice of innocence to capture subverted and unwritten histories. His book, Berlin Childhood Around 1900, is a series of glosses, memories of past debris, fragmented and lyrical. Berlin Childhood, in fact, has much in common with the approaches of comic artists in relaying their childhoods. Like a comic memoir, Benjamin's recollection relies on painting very specific images and leaves the reader to piece together the narrative. Benjamin, uh, he begins his memoir as follows. In 1932, when I was abroad, it became clear to me that I would soon have to bid a long, perhaps lasting farewell to the city of my birth. He goes on to say, I deliberately called to mind those images which in exile are most apt to waken homesickness. Images of childhood. And thus he sought, and I quote, insight into the irretrievability, not the contingent biographical, but the necessary, necessary social irretrievability of the past. In exile in Paris, Benjamin didn't look for the past for comfort, but for clarity regarding present hopes, about, regarding the present and hopes for the future. As Simon Slight writes in a review of Benjamin, hope lies in the past, in spaces of play and imagination, where nothing seems impossible. This is a powerful notion, that looking backwards can be a force for creativity and future thinking. Like Satouf's Arab of the future, Benjamin's recollections rely on the sensory, smells and touch. These are recurring elements in Berlin childhood as well as Arab of the future, and in almost every narrative of childhood. Parents, extended families, illness, household objects, whether telephones or televisions. There are books, home interiors, the supernatural like ghosts and spirits. There are gifts and presents, sweets, we watch family members age. 
we learn about death for the first time. Both stories contain fragmented memories, moments that cannot be fact-checked and that the reader really participates in. So one might argue that these authors are waxing poetic about childhood, and it's just an unabashed exercise of nostalgia, a, re a misguided longing for the past. Uh, but the literary critic Frederick Jameson argues that Benjamin is radically reinterpreting the past. And Jameson writes, there's no reason why a nostalgia, conscious of itself, lucid and remorseless dissatisfaction with the present on the grounds of some remembered plenitude cannot furnish as adequate of a revolutionary stimulus as any other. So what Jameson means here, nostalgia needn't be a negative thing, so long as the view to the past is critical and probing. So what can we say about how Satouf faces his childhood, the choices he makes and the stories he tells? And as I gestured in my punchy title, what does this say about the future of Arab comics? Before moving on, let me sketch out some distinctive features of the Arab of the future. I'm not just arbitrarily transposing Benjamin to this text, but rather posing questions of how other authors have engaged with childhood and how Arab of the future does so distinctively. First, while Benjamin finds hope in his middle-class Berlin upbringing, Satouf mostly re-experiences the pain of a difficult childhood, playing with a neighbor's BB gun in a Libyan high-rise, or gazing out the window from a half-built home in a Syrian village. Satouf renders his story with humor, but there is little funny about him catching a virus in a village outside homes when antibiotics are scarce, or in Libya, him eating uh, state rations of bananas for days, going hungry, even though Satouf loves bananas. And then secondly, Satouf focuses on the troubled figure of his father, a sometimes misogynistic and uncaring narcissist. The father, Abdul Razak, is a strappy professor in Pan-Arabist who seems to put his own interests before his family's. Yet Satouf renders his character artfully, always maintaining love and admiration for his father, as a child would, without commenting on his father's shortcomings. Throughout the Arab of the future, Satouf shows the power of alternative modes of history. We meet Qaddafi and Assad on billboards. We hear kids in the schoolyard applying what they have learned from television sets and parents as they brutally slaughter a neighborhood dog. The kids play with toy soldiers, Syrians versus Israelis, or toy guns. We see how state policies of violence trickle down to the lives of youth. Sir, uh, crucially, there is a matter-of-fact nature to the storytelling, this child's point of view. On a trip to homes for shopping and such, the young Satouf witnesses a public hanging, for instance. We don't hear the child's inner monologue or the author's current reflections, but rather the father's apologist reply to state terror. That's life, he says. It's horrible, but it's necessary. It sets an example. This is the way people stay peaceful and law-abiding. You have to frighten them. This is terrible parenting, of course, but it's also the things of life. In the next scene, on the bus ride back to the village, Satouf's father encounters an old boyhood buddy, Tamer, who has a fear of snakes. Tamer asks if young Riyadh had memorized the first sunnah of the Quran. Then Abdul Razak, the father, impersonates a, stake, a snake and drives Tamer to tears on a public bus. It's a scene of embarrassment. At least I, as a reader, was embarrassed as the father acted out like a child in the schoolyard. The father, he frightens for no reason, and then in turn goes home to teach Riyadh the first sunnah of the Quran. This sequence of scenes captures the ambiguity of a child's view. The reader consumes an unadulterated view of state repression, the performance of religious piety, and parenthood. This is only the Arab of the future's first volume, and what Satouf holds out are at least three more books of darkly humorous vignettes that force the reader to view the world around them as a child. Now, I just want to bring in two other examples briefly to kind of fill out what I'm speaking about in, in terms of uh, reoccurring elements of personal comic narratives. The first depicts the importance of childhood and identity to the contemporary comic memoir. It's a 2014 graphic memoir called Beetroot, an unreliable memoir, by the British illustrator Barnaby Richards. In 1980, Richards' father moved the family to Beirut 
which the young Barnaby mispronounces beetroot. So I don't need to explain to this you know, very smart audience about the impact the Civil War has on a young child. And, th and this is what we've been talking about much of today. But in Beetroot, we see Richards creating a fantastical world to cope with bullets and car bombs. Uh, as he pieces together his childhood memories in Beirut, which are all fragmented, and he has to interview family members to really remember them, he realizes that his most heartfelt memories were totally made up and that memory plays tricks. And indeed, these are important aspects of memoir. And I want to draw out one point. We need a broad definition of Arab comics that goes beyond the strict boundaries of national identity or linguistics. Because in Richard's Beetroot, we, simula we see similar tropes to that of Lena Merhaj's comics or other Samandil creators as they work through their childhoods. We see children's power to survive the trauma of air raid sirens the sight of guns and bodyguards and armored cars, the things of superhero comics manifested in real life. Second, a little different, is Shinawi's comic of the future, uh, a very different kind of personal narrative. This is from the ninth issue of Tuk Tuk, in which Shinawi, our friend sitting in the front row, imagines Cairo 60 years from now. Nothing has changed. The cityscape looks the same. The TV antennas and satellites look the same. It's the same. So the 80-year-old the Shinawi sits on a wheelchair in an empty downtown apartment, <laughs> uh, gazing at a photo of his old buddies, the gang of Tuk Tuk illustrators. Uh, Shinawi wheels himself to the Osir O'Neill Bridge to end his life, only to then encounter a young Makhlouf, a spitting image of his longtime friend and a comic artist. It turns out that it's Makhlouf's grandson, who takes Grandpa Shinawi to the posh offices of the elder Makhlouf. The two brawl and fight a bit, knocking off each other's toupees and dentures. I'm sorry I didn't scan all this. You'll just create visual imagery here. And um, the reader then learns that the future of the other tuk-tuk guys, one is driving a taxi, another is in jail. Our friend on deal is a soccer coach in Ireland. <laughs> um, so a reunion of these artists would be impossible. So Shinawi attempts to suicide again, only to wake up from a dream, really a nightmare, a stress dream, a deadline dream, as the illustrators of Tuk Tuk hover over Shinawi, who's asleep at his desk. Shinawi's prophetic dream speaks to the impossibility of recreating the present. There will never be a reunion. All we have are deadlines and more to do. Now I realize that Shinawi's tale is about old age, and the Arab of the future and beetroot are about childhood. But I think that adolescence and aging are indeed eerily similar phases of life. But what does the Arab of the future, Satouf's personal comic, actually say about the future? For that, we turn to the penultimate page of the first volume, when a young Riyadh and the family are in France on holiday. And here's the frame. Um, they take a boat to Saint Malo, the French port city, where his father withdraws thousands of US dollars. I know the last year in Syria was hard, but everything will be better now, says the father. And little Riyadh is devastated. We're going back to Syria, he yelps. Of course, replies his father. The summer's nearly over. You can't spend your whole life on vacation. The Arab of the future goes to school. This dialogue, an offbeat bit of dialogue, is where the name of the memoir comes from, obviously. And then on the final page, the family boards a Syrian air flight as Riyadh whimpers. The Arab of the future goes to school, which is to say that the Arab of the future can't remain a child forever and has to become an adult. The second volume of Satouf's memoir is set in Syria, where he finally goes to school. It's in this comic about the past that we can begin to think about the future of Arab comics. From Satouf's album, we see the mainstreaming of issues pertaining to Arab identity in Europe, Issues that are rendered through a Syrian lens, but that readers who grew up anywhere from Algeria and beyond can relate to. Additionally, Satouf gives a critical treatment to the pan-Arab ideologies of the 70s and 80s, movements that we today, us Arabs of the future, seem to have forgotten about amid the rise of other dark groups like Al-Qaeda and ISIS and the decline of pan-Arabism. Uh, will the future of Arab comics continue to look towards the past? 
Will the future of Arab comics be just as personal as Satouf's album? Will it be narratives of children growing up in Iraq and Syria during civil war? Kids coming to terms with the dirty aftermaths of the Arab revolutions? Or something radically different? Rather than predicting the future of Arab comics, or conjuring up some sort of sci-fi futuristic vision here, I want to pose some questions for the participants in this symposium. Is the, way, is the new wave of comic art that we are seeing from Egypt, Lebanon, Tunisia, and beyond representative of the future? Many of these publications, like Tuk Tuk, are four or five years old. Uh, Samandel, maybe eight years old. What will it mean when these young publications become adults, so to speak? And what will the future of Arabs, uh, Arab comics, how will it be reconceptualized to include voices as diverse as Satouf and Barnaby Richards, as well as others from across the world who grapple with the same issues using the same art form? So I'm not sure if I actually answered my initial question about why comic artists have a tendency to draw about their childhoods. But after reading Satouf, I had three thoughts. First is that, as I noted in the beginning of the presentation, children are truth tellers. Through the simplicity of the child's perspective, we can gain new understandings of the past and uninhibited views of the future. Telling the story from a child's point of view is not just a, a tactic of cuteness, it's an approach that actually problematizes the biases that we as adults hold dear. Second. Childhood memoirs are a way to work through all of that childhood angst. It's basically an illustrated version of the psychiatric couch. Third, and this is perhaps what I'm thinking most about and definitely connected, is, is what Benjamin notes in the introduction to Berlin Childhood. He writes, it began to be clear to me that I would soon have to bid a long, perhaps lasting farewell to the city of my birth. So to write about the past is to finally part with it to find meaning in it, and thus to shape the future. It's in this way that Benjamin recollects his childhood. He somehow presciently describes a way of life that the Nazis were about to erase. And isn't this exactly what the Arab of the future is doing? Satouf has captured a way of life in Syria that is now disrupted and destroyed. A return to Syria is now impossible. Yet this graphic novel, in this graphic novel, the story of Syria is just beginning. At, uh, at Cairo Comics Festival last month, which our friends Magdi and Shinawi hosted, uh, my dear friend and co-panelist Jad Khouri made a very sharp comment. He said that we are a people who ignore our history. Thus, and in conclusion, the Arab of the future looks towards the past. Thank you. So it's Leila Abdelrazak now who we're going to have, yes. who is, uh, will tell you the title of her own speech. Hi. Um, so before I begin, I just want to um, thank uh, you all for having me here today. Um, it's really such an honor to be here, standing next to so many um, talented and um, incredible artists from throughout the Middle East. Um, I'm Leila Abdelrazak. I'm the author and illustrator of the graphic memoir, Badawi. Um, which is a story about my father's life. He grew up here in Lebanon um, in the Dawi refugee camp, which is just a little bit north of Tripoli um, during this, the Lebanese Civil War. Um, and so the book kind of explores his um, experience with that um, and it's kind of, I guess, a coming of age story that deals with all, that, all the political context of being a refugee, of being um, you know, the Palestinian diaspora, the Civil War, but through that personal lens um, and also um, through like another layer, which is my view of everything that happened, which I'll expand on a little more later. Um, and I, um, as was mentioned, I, I was born in Chicago. I grew up there. Um, I grew up between Chicago and South Korea. Um, so I grew up in as part of the Palestinian diaspora. Um, and so um, this book is kind of a, a culmination of like my dad's memory of everything that happened, but also like my understanding of all of that as somebody who didn't live in it and who has been in diaspora my whole life. Um, although this book is, and actually a lot of my work is uh, about the Palestinian issue in the Middle East, this is only my second time speaking outside of the United States. Um, the first time was during the Palestine Festival of Literature, um, where I had the opportunity to speak at Bethlehem University. And, um, 
I always feel more nervous talking to audiences in the Middle East because I feel like my I'm accountable to other Arabs, other Palestinians particularly. When I'm speaking to an American audience, I really don't care if they think my work is too, Zion, uh, too anti-Zionist or um, anti-Israel or too political, you know, I really don't care. But, um, you know, when I'm telling this story, I feel like I have a responsibility to, um, because yeah, this is my dad's story, but it's also like, the story is really common. It's not such a unique story, and I didn't write it because it's a unique story. I wrote it because it's a story that um, a lot of people can relate to or have experienced, and so um, I feel that my responsibility is to people who actually can relate more closely to the story. Um, and um, so it's always more, I guess, vulnerable to speak in front of an audience that maybe feels like this story is like, representing part of their experience. Um, when I started writing the book, I decided for myself that the only story I was accountable to was my dad's story, um, which is a Palestinian story. Um, and making that decision uh, was really liberating for me in a way because in the United States, especially, there's this double standard um, when it comes to representing Palestinian stories. We're expected to, uh, often when we're telling a Palestinian narrative, we're expected to provide the so-called other side in order to seem legitimate or to um, gain legitimacy. Um, we have to be balanced, um, is you know, what they'll say. And so we as Palestinians, in that sense, are viewed as inherently biased or too emotional or incapable of telling our own histories or explaining our own narratives. Um, and so if we want to tell a Palestinian story, we're expected to provide some, some kind of counter narrative. Um, and so uh, for me, like deciding to only be accountable to my father's story, um, like I said, it was liberating because, um, and, and this is like what this form, like this particular form of like graphic memoir did, it liberated me from the need to do that because it revealed the double standard um, in that in that sense, like whenever Israelis or Zionists wanted to give their perspective, they were not expected to give the Palestinian side. Um, and so writing something from a personal perspective about my dad's childhood, like nobody else, when they're writing some kind of graphic memoir about a personal experience or a family experience, would be expected to give some kind of counter narrative for the purposes of gaining you know, political legitimacy or whatever else. Um, and so this form in particular, kind of freed me to tell the story without having to like give some kind of balanced um, political narrative. Um, and so when I made that decision, uh, it allowed me to do, I kind of took it and ran with it. Um, so one uh, thing that I, that I decided really consciously that I was gonna do, um, not only you know, in telling this particular story was I not going to like give the counter narrative rhetorically, like I wasn't gonna put in passive language like saying, oh, um, Palestinians left Palestine, no, we were ethnically cleansed. Um, so making sure that I was uh, really intentional about the kind of language I used. I also decided very intentionally that I was never gonna draw the face um, of an Israeli soldier. Um, and that's something that has actually uh, not only did I use that consistently throughout my work, I kind of um, represented Israelis or oppressive forces as these shadowy figures or monsters. Um, this also like uh, influenced a lot of my other work. So these are some drawings um, that I did from a series uh, that I did after I went to the Palestine Festival of Literature. Um, so again, like when I was drawing my experiences in Palestine, this. I used the same technique. I was not going to ever draw Israelis' faces or, um, you know, even sometimes intentionally dehumanizing in a sense. Um, and that was a choice that I made really intentionally um, because I didn't want to give any space in my work to that narrative or that, um, or legitimizing that narrative. And this was especially important to me. Like, you see films like Waltz with Bashir. Um, and to me, like, I hate that film because it kind of legitimizes or humanizes or, um, makes excuses for, you're supposed to feel bad for these people who committed these massacres. And for me, I don't want to give any space in my work to any of that. And so um, all of this has been a really intentional choice for me um, that's like impacted the rest of my body of work as well. Um, one time I was talking about this issue and 
somebody in the Q&A session um, told me that it was my responsibility to draw the faces of those soldiers. Um, and that was actually, weirdly enough, the only person who ever said that to me. It was actually when I was speaking in Palestine. It wasn't when I was like in the US. I don't know why this person like was like, no, you have to draw their faces. Um, but basically, I replied by saying that um, if you saw, like, I'll flip back to it, but basically on the cover of the book, um, I'm directly referencing Naji Alali's Handala with the pose that um, I drew my dad in. And I, my response was basically that, um, you know, like, look at, if you see Naji Alali's work, you never see Handala's face. In so many spaces, like, you see Waltz with Bashir, you see, like, all these complicated reasons that these people like committed this massacre and they're so complex. But you hardly ever see representations of Palestinian refugees. And I responded by saying, um, I'm interested in Handala's face. I'm interested in exploring the multiplicity of faces. Um, and so for me, that's kind of what all of this project was. Um, it's not, again, not because I think that the story is so unique, but because like sometimes after I talk, people will come up to me or people have come up to me and been like, Oh, like this part of your book, the exact same thing happened to my dad. Oh, this part. So that's telling those stories that, especially in the United States, like are really not ever told and never heard um, are the reasons that I wanted to create this work. Um, and I can't understate the importance of putting this narrative out in the United States. People really don't know anything um, about the history of Palestine. Um, and actually, like my. Uh, the reason I got involved in creating comics in the first place um, was through my involvement um, in student activism at my university. I was involved in a group called Students for Justice in Palestine. Um, and we were trying to inform people about the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement against Israel, the BDS movement. And I, you know, we were trying to come up with like different ways to talk to people about it, find flyers online, and everything just like all the flyers that were available online or like little info sheets about BDS were so like, I was looking at them and I was like, I'm interested in this subject and I wouldn't even want to read this. Why would anybody who like doesn't care, or doesn't know about it, ever want to look at this stuff? So for me, um, using comics, like the first zine I made was about the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. And this is like a couple images from it, um, but basically the reason I was drawn to comics was because I realized that it was a way to make accessible information, like make information accessible to people um, who might not other be, otherwise be interested in what we're talking about or um, share stories that people haven't already heard before um, and gives people something else to draw them in. Um, so like, you know, maybe they might not be interested necessarily in the beginning about whatever we're talking about related to Palestine, but maybe they'll be interested in looking at the illustrations or something. And that's a way to draw people in. Um, and so for me, that's really important. That's like the reason that I was drawn to comics was because it's a great way to, um, I guess, involve people in something that they might not otherwise be interested in learning about. Um, and, uh, And so that's basically why I started working on the project Badawi too, because like I said before, um, there were not many people who knew these kinds of stories or had heard these kinds of stories outside of Palestinian communities. And so when I started working on it, um, it was really just a webcomic. Like I was taking little anecdotes, stories that my dad had told my brother and I growing up, um, and posting them online. And they were just short little vignettes, short stories. One of them, like the first one I did, was about playing marbles in the camp. Um, I wish I had included the um, image, but I didn't put it in. But like, even like little everyday stories like that. Um, I was just posting them online um, because what I realized is that these narratives, though they seem common, and you know we had heard these stories over and over again to the point of being like, Dad, stop telling us that story. Like we heard it 80 times. We get it. Um, those stories were not heard outside of those communities. Um, and so again, it was this desire to inform people about Palestine or the refugee issue um, that you know, made me start posting those comics online. Um, and then eventually, people from my publisher, Just World Books, uh, noticed the webcomic, and they asked if I would be interested in turning it into a graphic novel. Um, 
So I said yes, of course, and I had no idea what I was getting myself into, and it kind of like was in over my head a little bit. Um, and I was a full-time student, so it took like three years to write the book because I was also involved in student activism, like I said, and also taking classes and also working. But eventually, um, I pulled it together. And it's really opened a lot of doors for me, but I think the most important thing it's done is it's allowed me to enter non-political spaces like comics expos um, and inform people about Palestine, basically. Um, at some point, when we're doing like Palestine activism in the United States, it often, feel, it often feels like we're preaching to the choir. We always get the same people. We always are talking to the same people about the same things, the same audiences over and over again. And um, the publication of this book allowed me to like, sometimes I feel a little bit like a political like undercover like instigator, like I go into this non-political space and then I unleash this thing on people and they are often just like, whoa, we're not expecting it. Or, um, you know, if I ever speak, um, like I, I've spoken in high schools, I've spoken all in all different kinds of places and Basically, I go in under the pretext of, oh, I'm this person talking about this book about my dad's childhood. And then I use that to basically inform people about the history of Palestine, the Nakba, refugees. Um, and in my opinion, one of the most important things is um, I talk to people about the importance of the right of return and how central that is um, to the Palestinian struggle. And so basically, like I've been able to use this to go into spaces like libraries, theaters, comic cons. Um, and wherever I have a chance, like whenever I'm given the mic, I use it. And I use it very in a very intentionally political way because um, I see it as an opportunity to kind of like take that moment and um, inform people about what's going on. Um, and to me, that's really important. Um, and this is important, again, because under the current circumstances, Israel's ethnic cleansing is, as you know, not only limited to removing people from the land but, uh, and murdering people, but also erasing our history, appropriating our culture. Um, and so when I was working on the book, I did a lot of things to intentionally uh, take back, or not take back, but reclaim in a very intentional way, um, elements of our culture that are maybe being erased. Um, aspects of our history that are being forgotten in the um, Western context, at least. And when I look at you know, the larger, I guess, body of uh, work around Palestine in comics, um, a lot of people bring up Joe Sacco. And Joe Sacco, I mean, I really res respect the meticulousness of his research and his drawings. But um, for me, it's so, so important that people tell their own stories. and. Uh, you know, whoever writes the history of a people has power. Um, right now, like I was saying, like with cultural appropriation and everything, Israel is and the United States, the way they present the history, they're rewriting it, they're erasing parts of it. Um, and so with all due respect to people like Joe Sacco, who are doing really important work, I don't, as like an artist, I don't want to see more white saviors coming in to write our histories for us. As Palestinians, and as a Palestinian, it's important for me um, that we write our own histories and that we represent those histories in certain ways. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's this old cliche, I guess, but it's true about how knowledge is power. And for me, that's what comics can do, and that's the importance of personal narrative as well. It's like, you know, we can write our own histories um, from our own perspective about things that have happened to us or things that we've dealt with. Um, but again, uh, there's this issue that a, f a few other presenters have touched on about what it means to write such a personalized account of history. Um, so, you know, there's uh, books and films on the Civil War and the history of Palestine and Lebanon and all this stuff, but, uh, you know, I only had one source in addition to all those, like, research materials, I guess, which was my dad. And, uh, you know, I'm working with him and his memory, and his memory is like not always, he'll like say something one day and I'll be working on it and then I'll call him up and I'll be like, okay, you know, I have a follow-up question about this thing you said and he'll be like, what, that never happened, when did I say that, that's not true. So on the one hand, there's the fact that I'm only working with one person. It's not like Joe Sacco, you see in his work, like he interviews all these different people and tries to piece together like exactly what happened. 
that's not what I was doing. I was like interviewing one person whose like memory is not always consistent or who changes his mind about what happened. Um, and also something that was mentioned before as well is that memory can warp over time or it can change based on your emotions or your perception of an event. Um, and as I said at the beginning, I was not only writing through this one person's memory, but also through my understanding of those memories. As a person who's grown up outside of Lebanon, who has not grown up in war, um, who didn't even really come here till I was 15, um, I had never like even been here. Um, and so those layers of understanding uh, obviously would produce a much less accurate image than the kind of thing that Sacco does. So rather than resist that, I just decided to embrace it. So for me, truth in this kind of personal memoir um, is not so much about exactly what happened, on what day, at what time, but the overall essence of the feeling or how it impacted my father or what his experience was. Um, and on top of that, there's also like the political uh, message that I maybe wanted to convey through the telling of that story or um, you know the larger theme that I was trying to convey in the scope of the book through the telling of that individual story and how all those little stories come together to make a narrative arc which I kind of impose onto those individual stories um, and so um, even though I don't write myself explicitly into the book, like you see with Spiegelman's mouse, like he's like there talking to his dad, like it breaks away from the story and you see his like personal interactions with his dad. I didn't do that kind of thing, but I'm still there, but in a more like, I don't know, in a less overt way. I'm there through like whatever kind of meaning I impose onto these individual anecdotes, which maybe by themselves don't really mean much other than, you know, it's something that happened. Um, and because of all of this and the way those stories and my understanding of those stories interact, Badawi is a Palestinian story and it's also inherently a product of diaspora and of being outside of Palestine. Um, and just as like a side note about that, to me that doesn't make it less Palestinian. I think that sometimes what I've seen in the diaspora is that there's almost this competitiveness or this like weird sense of like, people trying to assert authenticity, like who's more authentically Palestinian or what is more authentically Palestinian. And to me, that's all bullshit because at this point, most Palestinians live outside of Palestine. And to me, being in diaspora is inherently a part of also being Palestinian. And so um, all of that, like, I don't know, complex stuff about like having multiple identities or being in multiple places at one time is at this point part of being Palestinian, but, um, Anyways, uh, the point is like this story exists because I as a Palestinian was trying to take an active role in the writing of my people's history, as I said before, um, even if it's only one person's individual history. Um, and that for me, like given the context of the mass erasure of Palestinian history or Palestinian narratives in the Western media, that um, is an act of defiance just like not drawing the faces is an act of defiance or an act of protest. Um, and just to add on to that, like, although it is an act of defiance, I'm not the kind of person who believes that um, art alone can change the world, even though I'm involved in, you know, producing um, political work or political comics and even movement art. I have some examples here of like different, you know, illustrations I've done for different um, movements. Though I'm involved in all of that, I don't live with this illusion that like there's this romantic idea that like art is going to change the world. I really, maybe I'm, I sound pessimistic, but I really don't believe in that. What I believe is that every movement has a lot of different aspects to it. It might have an artistic aspect or a cultural aspect, just like it has, um, you know, a protest or uh, sometimes armed movements or sometimes all different kinds of elements that come together into um, to create like a larger movement. And so um, I guess I see my role within all of this as being um, linked to the cultural aspect. And the cultural aspect is important, but that alone cannot change anything. It has to come into play with all different aspects of a larger movement in order um, for anything to change. And so uh, for me, the telling of those stories or the production of movement art is something that can be useful um, to strengthen maybe a larger movement as a whole. Um, 
I guess I want to end um, with just a word to people who are starting out um, or who are maybe interested in comics or who maybe have an idea for something but um, haven't really worked on it. And especially to young women because as I said before, um, this is a field that is very male dominated, um, just like everything in this world is very male dominated. Um, but this industry in particular tends to be very male dominated and so, um, you know, I said before that I kind of went into this, didn't really know what I was getting into, just kind of like started working on this huge project that was maybe like more than I had anticipated it was going to be. Um, but I just want to emphasize, people should not be afraid to tell your story. Um, don't wait for someone to tell you that it's worth it or that it's good enough or that your work is ready enough or that you are advanced enough. Or, you know, people just, we just need to tell our stories. We need to just do it and get it out there. All I was doing was just posting this stuff on a blog. And eventually somebody asked if I wanted to make it into a book. But regardless, like, I was just a random 19-year-old with a webcomic. And I was literally, like, I drew the whole book. Like, this is the whole book. Like, I drew it on A4, like, printer paper and, like, ripped it into squares with a ruler. I had no idea what I was doing. Like, I did not adhere to any, like, standards of, I don't know, professionalism. Um, and I'm not saying, like, don't, don't, like, abide by any standards uh, because like a lot of times if you have access to that stuff like you know it, people their standards for a reason like people it makes life easier for people like <laughs> but what I'm saying is like you don't need anyone's approval to tell your stories you don't need any like I didn't go to school for art I went to school for theater um, and this is just something I like to do um, the important thing is that especially like especially as a Palestinian growing up in the US um, like I said before, like you're people just constantly telling you you're not, you know, you need the other side, you're not like professional enough, you're not whatever enough, it doesn't matter. Just screw all those people, forget about them, work on what you want to work on. If you have a story, you need to tell it. And um, just be true to that story, be honest with yourself, and be know who you're accountable to. Like I know that I'm accountable to other Palestinians, and that's the most important thing to me. Um, and hold that in your work as the most important thing and just tell those stories. Um, yeah, I don't know, I can't overemphasize the importance of that. Um, and don't be afraid because if you're afraid, fear, that's something that you put on yourself. Like that's you boxing yourself in. So even if you're afraid of like what other artists will think or what other, whatever people will think, you just need to tell your story. Uh, tell it from a place of honesty, tell it from a place of love, and if you do that, people will see it and they will recognize it and they will thank you for it, regardless of any other factor. Thank you. Uh, his sister was hurt in the bombing in Paris, and therefore we cancelled his trip here. We hope that she's safe and everything's okay. He was our next speaker, but now we will have in the backstage of an Egyptian graphic novel. <laughs> 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 Mr. Mashki Shafi. Well, uh, good afternoon. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Thanks for Dina, and thanks for you all for coming. Um, I'll talk about uh, Metro today. And in fact, I was really uh, surprised. Why did Lena invite me in the first place whenever I'm not uh, talking about self-narration? And then um, we figured out maybe together that fiction might be the most important storytelling thing, history-telling thing. Uh, fiction is uh, more honest telling history rather than history books. And so we will go through uh, metro making, and I will try to tell you what was behind the scene. First thing, when I thought about metro, I didn't think about something big. I thought I just want to spell out. And the most important thing I realized afterwards was the environment. If you figure out the environment, and the rhythm, you will get into the story. 
You don't have to, to know what's the story exactly, yani. but you just know what's the environment and the rhythm. Every day when I was going back home, I was listening to this. And then I get into it. Yes, rock el kasba. It has got the rhythm, it puts me in it, and it puts the rhythm of the whole fiction intact. And he has had another fabulous song. Bye bye, Rashid. Uh, another very important song for him has been called Hasbuhum. Uh, like Hasbuhum, uh, yani. Yeah. Judge them. Judge them. Yes. Judge them. I was listening first to uh, Rock Kasba and then judge them and then some uh, thing for Munir, I think. I made a kind of uh, a list. And when I go, I come from work. I work regularly in a company and I get back at four o'clock and I uh, have to rest for something like an hour or two and then I have to work on this. So, uh, I was putting this list. And I have had the environment. But then I don't know how to tell the story. Um, I realized that I can tell the story. But I didn't know how to put it in a book. And so I sat with my friends and I, saw the, I showed them um, what's the story about. And some of the pages or the panels were already made. I told them, okay, that's, uh, this guy is going from this bank and he doesn't have money and brrr, And I told them the whole story. And after uh, I stopped, they were like uh, um, script writers and mostly script writers. And they said, okay, I, they were silent, tamam, uh, totally, after I, I, I finished. And I thought it was like suck. But they said, okay, no, just write it as you tell so as you have just told it. And I thought, OK, OK. And I told them, OK, is that the clue? And they said, yes. And since so that time, OK, I said, OK. I can tell stories. I can tell stories about anything, about how I drank that coffee, or I, I went to the plane, or, or So I can tell the story. But things afterwards were, OK, I'll tell the story about the things that intrigue me. Uh, I stopped reading. Um, and following the mainstream totally, long time ago, because of these guys, corrupted politicians like this guy, he was a big person in the parliament, in the Egyptian parliament, and at that time, it was only the time of hypocrites. So I stopped list looking at the TV, I stopped following the news, I was just looking at the titles, and I get sick, and I just uh, stop it. So I wanted to make something against this, mainstream or so, something at least different from this. And what really, what was really um, making me sick, how is they twist things and make something like moral uh, scandals. And in fact, they were the immoral. How can I tell this story? And in the time, when the time passed by, and I was working on it, working on it, working on it, I began to like become uh, in the heat, and there was no much time. So I was drawing this in the uh, in the meeting room in my company. There are these boring meetings, you know them, boring business meetings. So in the boring business meeting, I was uh, drawing the, like this illustration. And at that time, I didn't care about if the art is rough or is it so good because now it's rough and nasty. So I just keep it like this. And it was the most important question that I wanted yani, to, to address. OK, what if these people just like locked in a cage found out that this cage is opened? And that was the story what about. Uh, the most important thing practically is the characters. Uh, when I thought about, if, if we think about narration, definitely there will be something personal in the narration. When I tell a story of, uh, of uh, a young uh, um, um, digital geek uh, uh, person who's in, pers who's in business and he's 
about to bankrupt and he's suffering working in, in Egypt. He's suffering in his uh, emotional relation. He's suffering facing this corruption. I, I, there will be part of me uh, with this Dina. This girl, I really admire every girl who is walking in the streets of Egypt. It's like a jungle and just bold like this. I admire her from all of my heart. So I'm just telling part of my stories in every one of them. And the most important is that we leave the characters act as they are. And uh, in some point, you just find out that the characters are merely ripe up, not for you to, to, to influence. Maybe you put a shape in the beginning and all these things. But when things come to, um, to, to making up the story, I think the characters drive. And then we come to uh, the bad part, the language and the discourse. Uh, this is more for the academic. And if I thought about it like this when I, when I was making the story, I, th I think I would have made nothing. Because this is kind of consciousness that uh, doesn't allow you, from my point of view, to make good art. But for whenever we are in this academic, this uh, uh, يعني the great academic and the nice things we have to talk about. Okay, so I tried to make uh, these two levels of the language. And there is a totally another level. It's a totally different levels with totally different effects. So that's what I um, try to make. And so on with these characters like Mustafa and his brother, the harasser. Yeah, and we can notice here. Yeah, what, uh, what we can notice here, this uh, football player, at that time, there was this uh, hidden influence of the Muslim Brotherhoods with their secret symbols, like this football player who has been afterwards, like now he's, his popularity is really bad because everybody is against the Muslim Brotherhood. But at that time, it was really important to put these because this is kind of shaping uh, the minds of the people at that time. And uh, know about this, uh, when they made the robbery, they failed out to make the robbery from the bank, so they, stole, they have stolen this politician uh, getting out from the bank with billions. And they found people, so they, they told them, okay, here is this uh, corrupted politician, take him and do whatever with him. At that panel, that panel was really uh, confusing because it wasn't like this. I, I, was, uh, I was confused. What should I make? They will get out to the audience. What will the audience make? And a friend writer of mine told me, OK, the audience will immediately give him a petition paper. Please let my son go to the university, or uh, please uh, give me this. Uh, brand. I want my office or my dukan, or kushk, or haga fi al But um, I think that that was not kind of the discourse. That was not the, the, the purpose. The main purpose, the main purpose was rebelling. The main purpose was uh, making another thing than the mainstream. So making another thing than the mainstream, none of the politicians in Egypt at that time, people would make them like in their uh, underwear uh, uh, dotted uh, boxer or something. So I thought that if we make the people, just the regular people, beat the shit of him and tell him, <laughs> uh, and that was kind of part of the trial, definitely, because I think that also the prosecutor didn't yeah. digest it. Can you just explain what, what happened? Because not everyone is aware of that. Uh, it has been trialed. And the book, because of your, your graphic novel. Yes, it has been trialed. And you can get that, they can be they that to this if they are interested. In Many people talk about it. It has been bad because it was a bad timing, because it was uh, the time of the rise of April 6th. In the, in the meantime, that this has been printed. And my publisher was an activist, so they just dashed his uh, publishing house. And they found out this book with uh, photos, with, with, with pictures. So for a policeman, he's a uh, uh, yeah, homor assistant. Yeah, uh, just uh, found out that this book, oh, this is dangerous. They understood it, yeah. 
Yeah, that means that the, uh, the, the graphic narration is really, yes, effective. <laughs> this cool. <laughs> okay. Now, you really, really, this is the silly part of the thing, yeah. Well, uh, it was mainly about um, uh, how to address um, these titles, these difficult titles and to make them in a story uh, and um, I wrote something about this here okay. Okay. in the beginning oh yes, it's very important to say that I didn't want to um, imply any ideology or any philosophy or anything sophisticated I just wanted uh, uh, to tell to, to develop a work without political uh, direction. And just to answer some, some few questions. How will I make the level of the language? And how will I resist this kind of self-censorship? Because if I can come over this kind of uh, censorship, I think this work might also encourage someone to overcome his fears. So that's why uh, some of the story um, uh, events were like uh, encouraging for resistance. And if I thought twice about censorship, I also thought about my, uh, thought, told myself that if I thought twice about this, then I will lose the, cre the credibility. How comes that you want to say something not told in the mainstream, and you, uh, you are obeyed it to the laws of the mainstream? So I addressed everything just like they came. Uh, the sexual uh, um, quests, the political quests, and in order to come to this, um, I made uh, some researches for stick fighting from the ancient Egyptians to the Sufi dancing to the Saidi stick fighting, mm -hmm. upper Egypt stick fighting. And uh, I used some of my friends' names. So, uh, this director, Sheikh Riz, he was like uh, Sheheb, the hero. And these are from Al Ma'adi, the area. And it was photographed by our friend Sheikh Mustafa. I think it's very important uh, to use this kind of uh, research in our life. And I think also that the main thing that I wanted to lean on in this work was uh, to, um, to emphasize on a new basics for treatment, not a political basics, uh, not our usual moral basics, but humanitarian basics, and also uh, to stand up with love, this is very important. And it makes nice endings. <laughs> right? Okay, Shaggy, thank you. Any story or film or Arabic you have to think about it. Of course. Of course. Of course. Thank you so much, Mashbi. Amazing. I'd like, maybe when you sit down, to just to explain a little about the I know, I know. He's only been talking about that so much so. He also has Metro with him in Arabic. This is present for you because you told me you will not come to me again if you don't this. So this goes into our library, and our library now has the Arabic version of Metro. Oh, yes, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I can talk. Yes, go. <laughs> go. I'll do this slowly. <laughs> okay, our last speaker today is uh, Shinnawi, and he comes to us from Egypt as well. He's the founder of Tokyo. <laughs> Now we were the founders of the Cairo Comics Festival, which was amazing. 
and very, very inspiring in which we attended last month, uh, several of us here. Uh, yes, including people. And uh, so while he's uh, standing, I'll talk about Cairo Comics. So you must attend it next year if you're interested in comics. It is um, had a multiple platform of uh, discussions, exhibitions, um, meeting the artists, uh, book selling. It was a fabulous four, five, five hundred. It felt like five, five hundred days. It was five days. Uh, there were workshops. It was super rich and and meeting all the artists from Morocco, from Egypt, from Tunisia, from Jordan, from Palestine, from uh, Syria. Actually, the Syrians weren't able to come, so that was really very sad. As well as the Algerians and the Libyans, yeah. because of visa issues. So hopefully, we can bridge the borders in the Arab world. So I, but uh, comics will. <laughs> Hopefully comics will do that. I'm, I'm extending my thoughts on the Justin Combat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, hi, uh, AUB. Hi, uh, everyone. Yeah, hello. My name is Shinewi. Um, I will speak about, uh, since the, um, the forum was the symposium is about the, um, um, telling the story about the, your own me uh, memoirs, as you said. Um, I will speak about how I did, um, how the street, my, my talk is about uh, drawing the street and how I ended up uh, drawing what I really wanted to do from the beginning and how I did I um, um, discovered exactly what I wanted to, uh, to express. Uh, I think 15 years old, uh, 15 years ago, I um, started, to, started drawing in a magazine called al in, in Egypt. And with um, this character, it's, um, um, I don't know the name in English, it's Halazun, oh, like a snail. Escargo. Yeah. snail, yeah, exactly, a snail with a um, motor inside it so he can, he can fly. And it was called uh, Abu Sriya, the flying uh, snail. Actually, after um, I have done like 15 or 20 uh, pages, it was uh, like one, uh, one page uh, gag every, uh, every time. Um, and most of the pages, it was, he did, didn't fly actually. I, I wanted him to, to stay, when I, wanted, when I was creating the stories or the, um, the jokes, I, want, I wanted him to be in contact, uh, direct contact with the street. So I, basically the, in the beginning the, the um, character was supposed to fly, or th that, was the, uh, that was supposed to be the funny uh, uh, part of it, that he's a snail but he's flying. But actually what I wanted to really to, um, to tell was not uh, this joke. I wanted to tell um, jokes that happens in the street. Uh, by drawing few uh, pages and been published, a lot of people also no noticed and um, gave me comments about uh, some small, smaller details like in the whole page, about uh, people, about uh, things that are more related to the daily life in, uh, in Cairo Street. Um, this was the last last frame I have done for this series of, uh, of Abu Sriya. And I think from here I, I noticed exactly what I wanted to do, um, like um, what I wanted to, to make the combination of uh, drawing the streets that I really like, uh, of Cairo especially, and also to create jokes or to, to create um, artwork uh, about this uh, details in the street. Um, after that, I, um, I kept uh, working for uh, advertising and graphic design for another 10 years maybe, or nine years. And during this, uh, this time, I didn't publish anything. I was doing a lot of uh, studies and um, especially like drawing with my friends in the streets and draw doing a lot of research about mainly lighting and uh, uh, details uh, from the Egyptian uh, streets, especially in Cairo. Um, I also um, I also noticed that I I wanted to, to uh, um, not only drawing for children I wanted to make more sophisticated uh, stories about humanity and self um, um, uh, stories that um, shows more how a human being can uh, think about philosophical philosophical uh, uh, principles and stuff because. Every, everything that I, I have seen, all the um, stories I, was, I have been following in uh, magazines in France and uh, the States and everything, it was always about sophisticated uh, uh, stories and the stories are very, um, um, it's not about uh, joking or anything, it's more like, uh, like the festival uh, films we say. <laughs> um, 
And then during my research and um, my drawings that was not comic strips but um, only a few illustrations, I also noticed that I, I really liked um, like um, a drawing in streets and even if it was not in, uh, in Egypt, this is in a um, district in uh, Paris that is called uh, Barbès where, where uh, there's a lot of Arabs and uh, Africans. And um, th that was an, um, a situation that I, I noticed when, uh, there that uh, it was raining, everyone was uh, running, um, uh, going home, and then there was a bunch of women, three or well, four women, uh, I think from uh, Nigeria, or I don't know exactly where from, with um, very colorful uh, dresses. I think they were going to a wedding or something. And the contrast between the gray city, almost, and um, the colors of the, this woman's dresses uh, attracted me, and I, 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 and I found, out, find, found out that I, uh, this is exactly what I want to, uh, to draw, but the problem is how can I make um, comic strips out of these uh, details? Even, even small, uh, small details, uh, small memories from our, my um, high school with my friend Hefnawi and we were jumping from the, from the, yeah, uh, from to run, out, run away from the school. Um, by the year 2011, um, and also when we made the, um, created the magazine Tok Tok, um, I was also a, a part of doing um, comic strips in it. I wanted to draw just um, scenes from the Egyptian streets, uh, scenes that doesn't, doesn't really say um, a lot of things. It was um, a scene with a lot of details um, from the urban uh, scene, urban um, uh, scene, yes, and also the um, Comportement, how do you say comportement? Behavior, Behavior of uh, people in the street. Uh, it's very, very important in Cairo, very important thing in Cairo, um, how people look to each other. The eye contact is very important um, towards, I don't know, if you're a tourist, it's different if that, uh, than if you're a woman, than if you're uh, between two men. It's totally different and I really like this and I, I, I'm always trying to uh, express it in, in my artwork. Um, all, all the time I was um, trying to um, make like something like a photographic uh, illustration, but it, it was still with, with one, uh, one shot in it, but it was still, I couldn't uh, find the, what exactly I can, I can draw, like comic strips out of this. Um, yes, including also um, all the cars and uh, every, every small detail in the streets. Um, and in the, in the second issue of Tuk Tuk, uh, it came right, uh, right after the um, resi resignation of uh, the former president, Mubarak. And then it was the time that uh, the tanks came out on the street. I, um, I, I think um, it didn't happen, happen uh, from 15 or 10, 20 years ago. Uh, ago. And for, for everyone in, in, the, in the city, it was, of course, a very strange uh, this uh, event, but as Egyptians do, uh, always they, uh, they turned out this ev serious event to uh, like um, a background for all kinds of photographs and video clips. Um, I also noticed that uh, in Cairo, or uh, I mean in my city and also in my uh, district, the lighting is very different from, it's not different, but it's uh, very special for, uh, for me and uh, I, I always wanted to, um, to be able to draw this and that people, who, whoever see the drawing, these drawings, can recognize this kind of, um, uh, the, the, what is it exactly? I mean, because it's a mixture of everything, the lighting of cars with the, the, um, the, the not logical uh, place of lighting, because it's, you are free to, do, to put a lighting uh, anywhere you want, like on a garage with the uh, neon uh, colors and then you put another, um, another uh, lamp. So I always uh, uh, made a lot of um, uh, research to, to express this in my artwork. Um, in uh, in Tok Tok, uh, I also started with um, w also, uh, uh, again, one page uh, joke. Um, and I, I always was uh, trying to find another way of uh, not the things that I used to like before, uh, I wanted to, uh, to express a more original and more um, 
um, related to the straight uh, artwork uh, or jokes. Here, for example, it's uh, like a homeless man who was like uh, speaking to himself with a very loud, uh, very loud voice. And uh, once he um, he uh, passed by the this kind of uh, new businessman, um, and the businessman had a call, a phone call, and then he just speaks exactly the same way the other guy was speaking. It's just um, a difference is that he has a suit on, it, on him. Um, I also had this uh, this uh, character. It was an uh, advertising uh, panel. Uh, Suset, we call it in, uh, in Egypt, like a uh, lollipop. Um, and he, since he is in, he is on the um, in the street, like he he is all all the, um, the time on the street. So I made him like um, kind of my um, witness uh, of the all, all the events happens in the street. And also because I have been working in the advertising, and then I decided I will never um, I will never. Uh, work again in advertising, and I am. Um, I made also diff the difference between uh, graphic design and um, working on graphic artwork, and um, uh, commercial uh, graphic design. So I used this uh, this character as uh, to speak out of what I have been thinking. Uh, it was also a very good um, opportunity to um, in this uh, for this character story that I can express also my. Uh, my um, passion to, to draw the Egyptian streets with all, all every detail um, I have seen or uh, seeing all, uh, every, all, the, all the time. Um, yes, and uh, kind of the distraction and the accident the, the advertising can make in, <laughs> in the streets. Uh, yes, exactly. It's, uh, Kind of the graphic design direction uh, of the tuk tuk was to make a, uh, to bring a small detail from the stories and to make it bigger on the cover. I I have been all the time also uh, trying to find the language of uh, or the details that I can bring uh, um, can communicate in the comic strips that I do uh, f directly from the Egyptian streets. Here, for example, I don't know if it's uh, for you. It's uh, it's uh, visible, uh, but the, this kind of uh, bicycle with the green uh, box in front of it, it's always um, uh, for the Egyptians. It's uh, it's known for the Rubabek uh, sellers. Yeah, exactly. They they take uh, old stuff from people, buy old stuff from people, and uh, they um, resell it to other uh, stocks. And here, it's uh, an accident that accidentally the Rubabek guy became a Rubabek himself. Um, also, during the inside the stories that I have been doing doing for Tok Tok, um, I wanted also to always to uh, use again and again using the, all the details from the Egyptian streets that I really like. But I didn't want also to only to draw it like I've been doing before, drawing very well, but in a photographic way. Um, and here, for example, in the detail in the sequence, the scenario of the um, the story, uh, I wanted to uh, to show. A part of saying it's uh, like eight in the morning or seven in the morning, uh, I showed this guy who uh, selling uh, cotton candy, Ghazd al Banat in Egypt, and it's known that he's he comes very early, passes very early in the small streets in, of Cairo, and with a small uh, zomara like this, and he makes a very um, um, uh, recognizable uh, noise. And it's it's very uh, if you if you have been living in Cairo. You, when you uh, hear this voice and see this image, it's just, you j it's just the message will not be, um, it's a 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock. You will feel the lighting. You will feel the um, humidity of these small streets. And this is what I've been trying to um, communicate in these uh, images. Um, in Tok Tok also, I had this uh, character of uh, uh, Sayus, who is a um, uh, valet parking um, Homeless uh, man. It's not, he's not homeless, but he's he's uh, hanging out in the street all the time and uh, colonizing a uh, sidewalk to uh, to park the cars. It started also with only one um, page. Still, is, it's a one-page uh, comic until now. But it, I ha when I made it, I didn't. Um, I haven't uh, planned to be to have it like a character to be my main character. It started with only one uh, one page, and then the next issue, I thought, um, yeah, maybe I would do it, maybe I would not. <laughs> and then um, 
I have made, we have made uh, 14 uh, issues until now. One of them was longer, uh, a longer story, like 15 pages also. And every time I found another, uh, another uh, idea to make the, 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 the joke about. And it was not only that he is parking the cars and everything. I, I, uh, I had already a library of uh, a lot of details, visual details from the Egyptian streets that um, Sometimes only Egyptians um, can recognize it, but with a little bit of explanation, uh, it could be uh, uh, comprehensible for, for others. Here, for example, it was, um, I have a friend in Cairo that makes a lot of uh, contemporary art. Uh, uh, depending of the shakman, I don't know in English, what is it? Exhaust, yes. Lebanese, Eshapman. Ashkman, <laughs> Superman, um, and also in Cairo, the, these guys who uh, are working the cause, they, are, they have a lot of uh, objects to uh, to keep the pl the places um, occupied. One of these things that uh, Shakman like this stuck in a, a cheese uh, box, and then it just um, looks like uh, the artwork that was been uh, for uh, 50, 50, uh, 15 thousand uh, Egyptian pounds. And he just simply took it, and uh, the guy uh, finally win, won. Uh, it's still the same thing here also. Um, I use the details also that people can uh, relate the kind of the car um, that is used uh, always for the Egyptian authorities' uh, cars to, to have someone and with a driver. It was the, um, this kind of Fiat uh, Shaheen, I think, uh, cars. Um, so he, here he, he, has, um, he has got an opportunity to give a lecture about how to uh, park cars and um, to avoid uh, the uh, winch or the panage. I don't know how to say it. The winch who takes the cars uh, from the... Um, he also... To avoid the winch. <laughs> Everyone will be, uh, will be uh, happy like this. Uh, he did also, it was um, uh, based on a picture that was uh, viral on Facebook that um, you, you, I think you are familiar also with the flea of cars, uh, uh, Toyota cars of uh, ISIS, Daesh, exactly. And the, that there was this uh, picture, and they said, the first were a panel, and they said, yeah, um, Daesh are on the Al Mahwar, is like a um, ring road around Cairo. And then it started from this picture that everyone uh, have shared it on fa uh, Facebook. I imagined where also Carrefour, the supermarket, is uh, on this uh, on this place. And then I imagined that they um, arrived at uh, busy uh, downtown in Cairo. And then the guy, of course, he uh, he stood up and he saw the the treasure that he uh, he um, going is going to collect. And then he managed to uh, to uh, park all the cars, everything, buying even uh, some sandwiches, uh, uh, full sandwiches for the, for the soldiers. And then he just he didn't notice uh, between, uh, uh, all the time that he, the, one of the cars have been put, um, ah. yes, <laughs> the, uh, 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 and of course the Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the chef of this thing, he beheaded him directly. Um, to continue also with my drawings of the Egyptian street uh, and still with my character, and then I co here I combined both. In one scene, I wanted to communicate the, what this guy is, uh, his universe, wh what is it about, and to try it also to, uh, to not repeat every time that he's just um, uh, parking cars and trying to uh, rub off the clients. Here, for example, as you see, have, he has... Um, uh, Santa Claus, and he ins insists to, uh, to take the five uh, pounds parking from him. Um, this, for example, for, it was um, a poster for uh, 2014 uh, uh, um, greeting card, and he's still also using the, all the things that they use to keep the places uh, mm -hmm. occupied for. Uh, <coughs> And the, uh, here it was um, a longer story, and so the <coughs> the um, how do you say the layout of the pages was different. 
but I still also wanted to keep uh, all the same uh, with the same character. It's all its own universe. Um, of course, I have been using a lot of uh, documentation, but I didn't want to to um, put a lot of effort to um, to draw exactly the um, with a lot of details the scenes that I want that I wanted. I wanted also m m more to communicate or to um, to show more um, the lighting and what. Uh, what uh, time of the day, for example, he um, because here he was uh, coming back uh, home and his uh, wife is uh, screaming "Lel Soda. <laughs> so I wanted to to communicate that he he came back uh, like at dawn or something. Uh, still uh, here, for example, also with uh, a lot of garbage everywhere in every corner, um, and how the the guy everything is co combined in the street and in these uh, scenes. Uh, this one, it was the second uh, page of this character that I have made uh, in the second uh, issue of Tok Tok. Um, and it was right after the revolution also. And uh, the difference here between the scene where I uh, draw people uh, making pictures with the uh, tanks, that, that now here I found out how, how can I combine what's happening exactly, or the scenes from the street in my own um, my own universe of, uh, or my own um, remarks of the street and of my own universe that I wanted to create. And the difference between the, the second issue with the tank here, for example, because it was the, a new thing, and then four, five, uh, four years uh, uh, later, the tank, there's no place, there's no more place for the tanks in the street, but still the hypocrite uh, character is. He's saying, yeah, yeah, come again, come on us again, and there's a place, um, there's a place for you here. Thank you, everyone, and uh, this is my website if you want to. Uh, Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Previous panel than for this one, but it's triggered by your work. And I would, I would like to read Samir or Mickey wearing uh, a galabia and a gun in the same lens. I would read your work, which is politically engaged in a certain anti-colonial moment. So, regardless of what we think of straight state structures and policies and the ideologies of the time, I, I would advocate for reading that is more contextual and that takes them, like that, that reads them in the spirit for which they were created. Okay, that's, um, those are both very big questions, or, um, <laughs> but I'll try to address them. So um, I guess to the first part, um, some of the stories in the book actually like, you know, like I said, like when I started working on it, they were stories that I had heard over and over and over again. Then when I, s when I got the offer to make it into a book, I started doing more, um, deliberate, like, asking specific questions about specific things that happened. Um, but a lot of it, like, even though all of it is true, um, there are parts that, like, I imposed or that I kind of embellished, especially, like, I use a lot of surreal imagery. So that, or, like, I, like, there's the image of him, like, dreaming, like, he slept with a knife under his pillow. Like, that's not a dream he had. That's something that I embellished I guess and put in there even though he did sleep with a knife under his pillow but like my like visualization of what that means is that's you know what I'm imposing on on that thing that he told me um and then some of the stories like he didn't even tell me some of the stories in the book like my mom was like 
your dad will never tell you this, but I'm going to tell you it anyways because I think it's important. And he just didn't question it. Like, he didn't question where the story came from um, and just, you know, let it be. And so, like, all of that kind of came together in that sense. So a lot of the, like, visual stuff or the surreal imagery, that's all, like, obviously my embellishing real events. Um, but that's, like, a big part of... Like, that's where I guess I, as a person or an artist or whatever, come into the story. Um, and then <sighs> the second part, <laughs> could you, like, it was kind of more of a state. Do you want me just to respond to that state? I mean, yeah, I don't know. It's, uh, is there, like, something you want to, I don't know. Could you, like, restate it or, like... So in the same sense that we could uh, read Samir as uh, didactic, as mm -hmm. uh, as imposing a certain kind of violence on a seemingly innocent character, uh, and in connection to what you said about your work being perceived in the U.S., what would your response be towards being politically correct, quote unquote? Mm. Um, well, the issue of like it being didactic or whatever was something I thought a lot about because in a lot of political work it is didactic and it is like very almost preaching and whatever and I really didn't want nobody wants to be preached to and I think that everything is political and so like just by telling that story that's a political act and um, I didn't feel the need to be didactic in asserting my political view or whatever else because uh, I just trusted that it would come through in the telling of the story and in the way I told the story so like like I said, I was thinking a lot about the certain like the way I drew images, the way I use language, all that kind of stuff, so that a certain political view would come through, or a certain political point would come through. But I did not want to because that's when people shut off. They shut off when they feel like they're being lectured, basically. So I really wanted to avoid that. I don't know if that addressed it, but yeah. I have the mic, so I'm asking a question. <coughs> Great talks by all of you. Um, I am really struck with, Layla, what you were saying at the end about um, accountability and audience, and thinking about that in terms of the question that um, Jonathan has posed to us about a more expansive version of Arab comics, a definition that could include work like um, Bait Root. Uh, I personally kind of have a, resist a resistance against that, moving to subject matter, because it feels like a slippery slope to the point of then is Habibi an Arab comic, is this guy who lived in Beirut when he was young but is writing for uh, an English audience, is that an Arab comic? For me, I, uh, my tension with that is kind of in what Shanawi and uh, Magdi were talking about where it's so contextualized, it's so, uh, you're, Shanawi, you're telling the stories of the Egyptian street and, you're, and you had that really good point that I was fascinated with how a female telling a story would be different and how a male's experience would be different. And ultimately, it, it's uh, my hesitation towards moving to that expansive reading of Arab comics is that if it's just, if it's brought more broad and just based on subject matter and who's writing about uh, what it's like to live in the Middle East, then it, it kind of removes the freedom, in my mind, of people who are in Lebanon to or Egypt to write stories that are not inherently about being Arab, but are about other experiences as well. Um, so that's that's my attention with that. And I just so I guess it's more directly to Jonathan. How would you read that accountability piece in terms of your intended audience um, in that idea of a more expansive reading of what Arab comics mean? Right. So Layla at the end was saying that she thought one of the most important parts uh, about her work and. And I really like the idea of, of you're saying the diaspora is part of the Palestinian experience. And, you know, Saeed writes a lot about that, too. And I've, I've been thinking a lot about that, too, with, with uh, in terms of, like, nationalism on Facebook and the wake of the France thing and the flags and all that. And Saeed would always say, like, nationalism is bad. It, it kind of divides humanity in, in these ways that are artificial, except we don't have enough of a Palestinian identity to be at that point with the Palestinian piece. So it's important to be pro-Palestinian and diaspora and the right to return and all these things are fundamental rights we haven't achieved yet on a national scale. So that's a little of a, of a what you call it, I went down that rabbit hole. But ultimately, that's what I mean about the audience is that 
in Layla's work, in, in your guys' work, you're writing for an audience and uh, that will read it and you're accountable to that same audience being in the region. And I guess I don't see how a comic like Beetroot, I feel like it's more cacheting off of a, uh, experience that this guy had when he was young, um, but it's not for that same audience. It's not necessarily well read here, uh, for example. So I, I would start by saying um, I don't think there's anything less authentic about a British gentleman who's five years old growing up here in, in the shadow of war than anyone else. But I'm not trying to make a kind of grand colonial argument or saying we need a really tight or loose definition of Arab comics. Basically, this is coming out of, um, I was just at this Algerian uh, FIBDA, the Festival de Ben de uh hosted by the Algerian government, and I met this guy, Barnaby, and I found that he actually had a lot more in common with some of the, the creators I've met with in Samandil, Tuk Tuk, Skef Kef, than a lot of um, even Algerian illustrators who are really strictly taking a, a BD approach to comics and telling uh, narratives that are very internationalized in this way. So I, I, I totally acknowledge the tension, Nadim, and I'm not trying to say, okay, everything is Arab comics or nothing is Arab comics, but I think that um, if we're just looking at what's on, on sale on the bookshelf in Arabic at Antoine or at Diwan in Cairo, then we're actually limiting the scope of, of the same way if we were talking about, I don't know, like in, like in your excellent presentation, we can talk about and Frank's diary, and then talk about what it's like to grow up in uh, a wartime Beirut. And there's actually quite a lot of continuity and a lot that can be drawn from it. Um, and then in terms of audience, I mean, this is, I think, a fundamental question for anyone drawing in a, in a new media ecosystem that's particularly digital, or digital first, you might say. And I think Layla discussed this in her work, how you know she was drawing for electronic intifada or online audiences, and then the book publisher comes to her. So I think we really need to rethink audiences because it's no longer the Samir of uh, a downtown Cairo newsstand or the Superman in Arabic that's sold on a corner in Hamra. We're now drawing comics for everybody. And that's what we see uh, with this heinous attack in Paris or this heinous attack in Beirut where cartoonists are reacting and it's, they're no longer just drawing for Lebanese consumption or Parisian consumption. The cartoons that they're drawing are going to be retweeted and shared by millions. So um, th that's part of where my broad definition is coming from. But yeah, I'm not totally going to hold on to it so tightly. Um, it's a very uh, close 
So I'm just because your presentation is about the Arab of the future, and um, I see that also you put the work of uh, Shemari. I, I really feel that um, um, yes, in a way, uh, um, it, it opens then here the, all the questions. You know, who is the who is the Arab? Who is the Arab of the future? Um, is, does it carry this uh, political or this cultural? Uh, 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 and then it opens all again the questions of authenticity. Is this childhood really true, or how how exaggerated is it? Uh, of course, comics is a uh, language that you can uh, um, that uses a lot of uh, exaggeration and strategies to to hide and show the invisible and all this. So what is, the questions are? You know, what did he uh, uh, edit, uh, and how did he focus all these? Uh, uh, stories that, that that they could show, you know, all this uh, um, uh, shit, you know. Okay. I, I just, I really would like to respond to that as a as a Syrian who lived that shit. <laughs> so um, I'm not going to claim that that it was all good and it was all wonderful and we we're all civilized. <laughs> I would like him, if he would like to say that, to be able to say that, and I'd like whoever sees it otherwise to say it, rather than to say, rather, well, I don't think this is working. It's, uh, it's better. It's, I, I think. I think, it, I think it's important that uh, that it's, if, if please, uh, I have something to say Rabia. about my country, I should not have a filter. Just as you said that, you, you should say what's in your heart and what's in your voice. And perhaps maybe I'm wrong, and maybe I'm very naive that he's not as I mean, he is political. He lived all his life abroad. He has a foreign mother, a foreign mother, and a Syrian father. So, and I see. I saw how I was brought up in Syria. Not in a day. Day is very different. In a village, it's very different than in the city. Of course, the city is going to have more cultured people, more educated, etc., and a different kind of mentality. But if he wants to say it that way, I think he should say it. And if we think otherwise, then we should show it. Mm -hmm. It's time we tell our story from our side, rather than say you shouldn't do that. Yeah, do that, but I want to do my way too. May, may I say something yes. from a, a French point of view? Thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, Riyad is a, a very interesting person because he always said, he told, I, I don't know if he had a lot of interviews in, in English, but in France, the book is so popular, it's a, so much a success that he has been interviewed many times and he keeps repeating, I don't want, the, the idea was I want to be straightforward to the page. That's my memory of it. It may be wrong, but I'll do it like that. That's how I feel about it. And there is no political background in my point of view when I read it. And because, he, of course there is, because it's his life and he went through all kinds of things. And the way he tells it is from an adult point of view, but he tries as much as he can, in my point of view when I read it, to go back to the anger, the fear, and all the things he felt when he was a kid. And to me, it reminds me of some great books about childhood, not only Anne Franck, as you mentioned, <coughs> but there is a French classic which is called Poil de Carotte by Jules Renard, you know, the guy with the red hair. And it's exactly the same in my point of view, is to go back to how it was when you were young and miserable, you were a kid and your mother hated you, as far as Jules Renard is concerned. And uh, it's very much the way um, Riyad deals with his work. <coughs> For years, he did in Charlie Hebdo. He did uh, probably the, a part of L'Arabe du Futur. He did something which is called La Vie Secrète des Jeunes. He goes in the street, in the metro, in Paris, whatever, and he sees scenes which are incredible. You know, adults slapping kids. Uh, teenagers being really rude to the others. And it's so crazy to him that he draws it just like that. And no comment, no nothing. And to me, L'Arabe du Futur is uh, an attempt to, do, to try and do the same thing with his own story. And that's all I can say. Just to add to this, um, the difference though is, you know, how many representations are there? You can't divorce this stuff from the political context that it's occurring in, and you can't divorce it from the current moment that it's that it's occurring in. Like, 
I don't know, maybe I just see it that way because for me, my work, when I, I come at it from a political, I guess, perspective or like reason for doing all this stuff. So for me, like to say like, oh, it's not about the politics, that's, it just doesn't work like that. Like that's not, we're not, we don't exist in a vacuum. And to me, like, I agree, like I think it's a little bit irresponsible, like, I don't know, not that, of course, everybody's critical of their own, you know, we all have, like, criticisms of whatever, but, like, when we're existing in a particular political moment where, like, there's so much, at least, like, as someone living in the U.S., like, so much discrimination, it, like, you know, all kinds of, people don't understand anything about the Middle East. They have very, like, warped ideas about what's going on. People don't even know, like, for me, like, people always think I'm Pakistani after I say I'm Palestinian. They don't even know what the difference is. Like, no, <laughs> nobody knows what's going on. You have to think about, like, who you're writing for, and you have to know who you're writing for. You have to know who your audience is. You have to keep all of that in the back of your mind when you're doing stuff. And, like, to me, like, I agree, like, I think it's a little irresponsible to just tell that story as if you're existing in a political vacuum, because we don't exist in a vacuum, and all of this stuff has an impact on real people's lives and the way people are going to be perceived. So, yeah, I guess it's his right to, like, tell the story the way he wants to tell it, but, like, when you write it for a French audience or when you write it for, you know, a Western audience or whatever, that's going to be, pr like, responded to and received very differently than if you're writing it for an Arab audience where you already have, you know, yeah, exactly, you know the context, you have a diverse, like, you don't have this one image of Arabs that's constantly being, like, you know, bombarded with in the media of, like, these people who are uncivilized or whatever, 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 terrorists, I don't know what people are saying about, it. you know, like, you have to think about the context that you're doing this stuff in, and to me, like, that's so important, and you really need to know, like, when you're doing this work, it's irresponsible to do it without your audience in mind or without, like, thinking about the impact it's going to have on people. So. I heard a lot about being responsible, being responsible, correct, and so on. Obviously, you have a political agenda, and you make it clear that you use the comics too as a, as a tool to uh, uh, perceive your message, etc., and so on. But this is one path in doing it in, in movies, in the theater, in literature, and in comics. But none has the right to say or to evaluate or to judge if others have a different path. And that's why I think the discussion should be about you know, when you do something, is it authentic? Is it honest between you and yourself when you do it? Uh, or not. So political, anything that we do is political. Anything that goes to the public will have a political repercussion, uh, consequences, and so on. But at the same time, some people might have a political agenda, and some others might not have. And specifically for, for Riyad Satouf and uh, uh, the Arab of the future, and here I join Jean-Pierre, he had a whole history in comics before the Arab of the future, and it didn't, and it wasn't different. You know, those who will read uh, uh, Riyad Satouf talking about the teenagers, whatever, etc., in France, might have the same attitude that you have. A French might say, French are not like that, teenagers are not like that, this is politically not correct for the, for the French people. And the same, I hear it here from uh, when we say, he, this is not the Arab, this is not whatever, he is, uh, uh, doing it, I don't know, whatever, etc. He was, I think, as far as I know him, he was consequent with himself and with the path that he uh, chose in uh, storytelling and uh, something like that. As if we say, uh, uh, satrapy uh, uh, against the uh, uh, Islamic revolution and why this is not correct, what she's telling about the Islamic revolution is something wrong and it is, not, it is irresponsible because it will shape the system, whatever, etc. The same with Zahra's Paradise, where they talk about the Green Revolution and how uh, uh, oppressed, brutally oppressed it was, and we might say, you know, no, this is whatever. So politically, we can evaluate things, but when it comes to comics as a, an art, uh, as a, an expression, then we should take the other 
or the wider scope why evaluating the electric And at this level, I think we, we can be less political in the sense of political agendas, yeah. And I'm not saying that he has to, you know, do something with this political agenda. All I'm saying, so he can be, you mentioned the yeah, yeah, but what okay. I'm saying is that I guess in my view, like, you have to think about that. Like, you have to think about the impact that it's going to have. That doesn't mean you have to enforce your political agenda, but that's something to me that, like, maybe we just disagree on that point. Yeah. Okay. okay, I guess just to respond to that. What Jeff is, and what's been said more broadly is like, and I, I want Jonathan to get in on this conversation too, because you know you brought the Arab of the future into it. But I, I think we can. I think in theory, yes, you know, and and I think what Lena said, yes, in theory. But we can't it, we can't just forget the that it that this is a comic that's going to be the best selling comic of the year that won Angolam that is selling two hundred thousand copies. And is widely read, is translated in over 14 languages. Um, and this, it, I'm not saying it's taking a spot from like a, a narrative of uh, of a Syrian uh, comic artist who maybe may portray something different. But I think we can't just say like, oh yeah, let him do what he wants. And I, I think we have to be critical of it and be aware that this is, again, another model of uh, growing up in the Middle East that's being represented of the like the dope Arab dad. Uh, and the like angelic European mom and he's he, his dad's silly and keeps getting them into worse situations and he's a pan-arab and isn't that you know foolish in a way um, and and for me I, I I just feel like I yeah I had a really bad reaction to the book but I, I would have been fine with that and said okay so somebody created a counter narrative fine but we can't ignore the fact that we need to be critical of it because it's so widely read that it's it's the New York Times is writing it up, the New Yorker. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna take the provocative one gets as a panelist to respond to it. You have the same attitude of the dictatorial regimes that run Samir and uh, Sindibad, etc., where things were not allowed and things not only allowed but should be politically correct. But you know, let 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 things go the way. You know? yeah. First thing, uh, I guess he has political, but his, his point of view, uh, I, I think that to, to some of, I, I don't want to, to steal the, but one thing, in my point of view, uh, he has a two fist, maybe it will say something to you. Uh, is more on the Robert Crumb side of things. Crumb always says, I am, at some point, I have to draw something which is on my mind or on my heart, and if I don't do it, I'm not faithful to what I want to do. And even though I'm, I'm going to be in big trouble with sex fantasies which are really offensive to women, I have to do it. I have to, because that's my job. And I guess it's more on this side. And just to elaborate a little bit on this, Krem lives in France for 20 years. And he goes back to the United States two or three times a year. And every time he goes back, he says, it's a crazy place. It's even crazier than I ever imagined. I, I could feel it when, when I was living there. And 15 years ago, he did, the, he did two stories which were when nigger take over American and when the goddamn Jews take over American, America. And it was his reaction to everything he, he heard when he was in the United States in the media. And he said, this is a crazy place. And he did this story and he had the, the most crazy, the craziest reaction, you know. And he, he, had, he, had, he was in big trouble because a lot of people complained that it was racist and everything. And he ended up saying, it was exactly the contrary, but maybe I was wrong. Maybe I did it wrong, but I had to do it. So he, his responsibility is that on a, a certain level, in his point of view, I completely understand what you're saying. It's true. On some level, it's true. But if you look from, from let's say, 20, 20 or 50 years from now, I, I would say the perspective will be different, in my point of view. 
because Puerto Cavati is terrible on the way a young kid in the country was raised in the, at the end of the 19th century in France. And that was true for him. And Jules Vallès, l'enfant de Jules Vallès, for another example, is also terrible from this point of view. And this was true. But it was not the, 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 the only truth. You know? And I think it's the point. And it's up to us to show the other truth. Yeah. How about, uh, let me respond just briefly, uh, since it's my paper, if you don't mind. Um, uh, I, I, what struck me in all of the commentary about Arab of the Future, and why I decided to give this kind of presentation on it, is that everyone's always trying to extract the political value of this type of text. And there's very little attention paid to the aesthetics or the methods of storytelling. So, um, of, of course, I, I think there's a, there is a value to comics that are educational or didactic or share particular narratives that, that are important uh, for their political value. I think they're really boring comics, the ones that are straight up, you know, they, they become very similar to history books. If you look at, there's the Martin Luther King in Arabic that describes peaceful protest movements. This is like the most boring comic book you could possibly read. Or some of these Algerian comics that tell the story of the revolution. There's no Algerian comics about the black decade of the 90s. They're all a very simple good and evil. So I think if we're going to read Satouf critically, I, I agree with you, uh, Jean-Paul, that we need to think about it in terms of someone like um, Crumb, but also Daniel Klaus, when he shows childhood in America, talks about the racism you experience. Even if you're a white American, you see racism against all sorts of different groups. That doesn't mean you know writing about it is uh, you're you're putting a scar on America. But I, I guess I just want to say that um, the question I still I think it'll be answered in future volumes of Satouf's book is why did he choose to tell this story? And I think, I think that's really the fundamental question. Not whether it's right or wrong, or whether it smears Arabs or smears Syrians. It's why did he choose to tell this story? And if someone fundamentally disagree with it, then maybe they need to draw a response of their childhood and how it's different. Um, I don't know if everyone or whoever read the, what was published in um, the two volumes. For example, the second one is not doesn't have the same rhythm and doesn't have the same intensive, um, sorry, the first one doesn't have the same repeated um, images of the, um, uh, the teacher is uh, um, uh, hating the, it, it was repeated in like, I don't know, two, 20 pages, for example. I, I think, um, for example, so if, if we take the first part, I think it was more, uh, it was more, yeah, it was more related to what he, Wanted the, uh, what he was exactly remembering from his uh, childhood. I think I can say that in the second one, he wanted to add more um, spices to these uh, memories. That's why he had to repeat mm, a thousand times that uh, the teacher was uh, hating us. The teacher was hating us, and uh, I find this um, it was a bit too much, uh, too much, and didn't go anywhere with it. So you can say you can see a little bit uh, difference. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't say. I, I think this is not. Good, but I, I don't say that everything in the, in the book. Uh, I do agree that the point is that people try not to see that. Like, yeah, exactly. people don't want to. But this is in a context. You're talking about the context. You're talking about the context. Yes. What do you want to do? What do you want to do? And that you have started all this. Can I have a question? Uh, I think no, there are two beautiful people who did uh, Shanawi and Jeffrey who showed representations of the street in Egypt, and they're they're so similar yet so different. Mm -hmm. And your colors are are giving uh, colors that only when you go to Egypt, Egypt to understand your colors. Because pink and green, and when you see it, you think that can't be. But then when you go to Egypt, you say, Oh my God, it's there. <laughs> And then his very rough, uh, sketchy uh, 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 approach to the, to the street and to what's going on with the dajjim and the music and that sound and, and your typography that, that uh, goes out of the bubble and over into the next bubble and then is hidden from it. It's, I mean, I think, I don't know if this is a question, but the, the street is portrayed so differently but so 
so uh, similar with uh, both of you. I think that's an important aesthetic, or so important. You both really studied the aesthetics of your, your street. Yeah, can I add something yes, about what you said? Um, in the early um, uh, issues of Tok Tok, we had a lot of comments that um, the stories doesn't end um, properly, <laughs> that uh, it's, it suddenly ended. And then, and then we had to explain to, uh, to the uh, readers that uh, it's like everything happens. We, it's not like a, an American film, you know, the, not American, it's not like a film. That uh, the heroes at the end, they kissed each other and they lived uh, happily. And things, doesn't, things doesn't happen like this. You have a fight and no one, no one wins. No one actually goes out of this fight um, with the police and he had his rights and the other one got his uh, punishment. No, it doesn't uh, go like this. Everyone is like uh, tapping on you, uh, no, no, you go, it's, uh, it's okay. So we said that um, the kind of also storytelling, it's, it's not the same thing that we learned and we have been reading. It's a little bit um, coming out of the context that we are living. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Well, I want to say something. That, that, was, uh, that has been a fabulous symposium, uh, Lina. And I really, really thank you and I appreciate every uh, participation from the audience, from the organization. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed every minute of it until the end, like now, Yanni. And uh, I also uh, I want to add something. In Cairo Comics and in the initiative, uh, I think that there has been something really mature that we never acted like two uh, uh, contenders. We have always been like uh, maybe influencing each other. And that's what made Cairo Comics success. Okay. So thank you again. We'll see you next time. Jonathan, thank you. I'm trying not to say your first name. It's just difficult not to say. Yeah, no, and thank you, Leila, so much. Thank you, audience, for being here. It was uh, so nice of you to be here and for everybody sitting. Please, Hannah, I would like to just say something about the library and our comics collection. I just want to invite everyone to the library to view our comics collection. We have, uh, we have early, juvenile, early juvenile literature into comics, so as early as the 20s Egypt, throughout Tuk Tuk, Samantha, Dushma, and whatnot. Uh, and from Iraq, Lebanon, Egypt, and uh, as So we're in, our opening hours are 8 to 5. You can come any day, every day. So are we going now? We can go now. I'm going there right now. Uh, all the titles are in the catalog. You can look them up. Many of the books, Leila's book, uh, Metro, etc. All of this work is in the library. So students or researchers, anytime, 8 to 5. The titles are in the library. Thank you. Thank you.